How's it going, everybody? Welcome to this week's Lumix Live. Uh, as the title says, we're going to be talking about autofocus today. Um, over the last couple of weeks, uh, throughout the various different forums and a lot of the questions that came through on the live streams, I, I've gotten a lot of questions, you know, asking about, you know, what modes to use, as we can see some of them in the chat here, um, and just kind of an, a more in-depth explanation of, like, what each mode does, uh, how the system works, things that you can do to customize it for your kind of shooting. So I uh, figured this way before uh, we're out for an extended period of time with recorded streams, I wanted to just take this opportunity to cover this where we can have an actual direct interaction. Um, since we're going to be away at NAB for the next two weeks and then um, I'm out for a week on some personal stuff with some event things that I'm working on. Uh, and you just figured this is a good time because we can also create a bunch of uh, recordings for the next couple of weeks based on what we all talk about today and some of the topics we had over the last couple of weeks. So, that being said, I, I have a lot to walk through and kind of go through with the camera menus and kind of go through that. So, as you have questions throughout this broadcast, make sure to tag at LumixUSA like you see in the chat there. Uh, as a number of other people are doing. Uh, it just helps me see it so I can get through to them. Now, if this is your first time joining Lumix Live, which uh, we have a very large number of uh, repeat viewers, which is awesome. I love that we have such an awesome community here. Uh, but if you're new, uh, these are weekly broadcasts that we do every Thursday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. 99% uh, of the time we're live. Every once in a while, we'll have to do recorded streams as schedules change and, you know, we may not be physically here in this location to be able to do the streams. Um, we cover everything from product demonstrations, walking through features, talking about tech, answering all of your questions, even sometimes having guests on. Uh, but the whole point of this is for you to have direct access to us, the brand, to be able to ask questions and get real answers from us, obviously, when we can. They're not everything that we can always answer. Uh, but basically make it where you don't have to rely on maybe people out there that don't necessarily know what's actually going on, what features do what, how it's working. You get answers directly from the brand. Um, so feel free to drop your questions in. We're going to be answering them throughout the stream. Um, as always, before we dive into the topic, I want to remind everybody about Lumix Pro Services here in the U.S. We have the red and the platinum tier available. The red tier is free. If you've bought a Lumix camera, follow the QR code or the link down in the description. Get yourself registered on it. Um, it gets you that three-year manufacturer warranty for any new purchase. Um, it gets you into the program, so if you ever do want to upgrade into platinum, you have the access already there to do so. Uh, if you want extended levels of service in the back end, be sure to check out the Platinum Level service. Uh, our Platinum Level is uh, it is a paid-for level service. That's going to get you things like two-day repairs with free shipping next day for both ways, so it minimizes downtime if you have to send in your camera and utilize it. You get 20% off out of warranty repairs. If you drop, break, uh, anything like that to a camera that's not under warranty, you get a discount on the repair for that. Uh, you also get access to a membership hotline from Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. So you have access to speak to someone instead of going through chats. Uh, and we also have annual sensor cleanings, EVF uh, cleanings, lens uh, calibrations, firmware updates, all that kind of maintenance stuff that if you don't want to handle it, you want to have us handle it, you have access to that with the Platinum program. So I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, if you are someone that is really heavy on your gear, it can be a nice way to make sure that every time you go into a new season, especially if you like wedding video uh, photographers or videographers, your equipment's ready to go and you know it's in tip-top shape before the season starts. So with that, uh, let's start this by taking a look at a bunch of questions that we got uh, that have come in so far. So uh, first one here says, my G9 Mark II... Killed a Wise V90 UHS-2, card cannot be read. Okay, uh, with something like this, a uh, couple things you have to check uh, if, if you're running into any kind of card problems. Uh, one, is that card a validated card that we have tested and, you know, kind of confirmed works on the camera? Uh, two, is the camera updated in its firmware level? So making sure you're on the most up-to-date, most current firmware level. Uh, and if anything like that ever happens, because it can happen with media, um, things can go wrong and media can get uh, corrupted. It just 
is a part of working with SD cards and honestly any media, check with the card manufacturer. Um, because card manufacturing can vary so wildly between various different brands, sometimes even within brands, you could, it could just be batches of certain cards may have a problem. When we launched the S5 Mark II and the S5 Mark II X, and we pushed out the validation list for SD cards, um, there were some situations where uh, some of the cards we actually note on the, the uh, validation page, you have to check, look for a, a specific little icon on the card. If you don't have that on that card, it's a card from a batch that is known to have an issue reach out to the manufacturer for that. Um, so if you're having those issues, uh, first, make sure camera's up to date, make sure you're using you know genuine batteries, third-party batteries can cause un um, unexpected power drops, uh, which can brick files, which can brick the camera. That's why we're so adamant about making sure you use genuine batteries. Um, make sure the card is on a validated list. If it's not on a validated list, it means that we haven't tested to confirm or put our stamp, uh, basically a stamp of approval to say like, yes, we trust that manufacturer's cards. Um, if it's not up on that list yet. Uh, and then outside of that, if you have it, contact the manufacturer of the card. Many of them have programs to support cards that have failures on them. Um, so yeah, that's what I would recommend doing there. Uh, still waiting for a big autofocus update on the S5 Mark II and the S5 Mark II X. I know everyone has been asking us for quite some time about that. If I, if I knew anything about firmware updates, I, I, I would love to tell people. Um, but even if I do know or did know, I can't talk about any of that kind of stuff. Um, it's kind of one of the, the things about being in the position I'm in. Um, but yeah, so today we're going to be talking about G9 Mark II Things that we talk about throughout the uh, menus that we go through are going to be relevant to the S5 Mark II, Mark II X, even the S5. Um, so don't think that just because we're using the G9 Mark II that it's going to be irrelevant to what you're looking at. I just use this camera because it is the most advanced of the systems that we have currently. So uh, it kind of encompasses everything that we do in all of the cameras. Um, Paul says, uh, on G9 Mark II, uh, please explain the estimated focus in SH1 and 2, how often focus is confirmed, and what effect does changing sensitivity adjustments in set 1 to 4 have on frequency of this? Uh, that is a good question. That is something I'm going to talk about once I dive into the menus. Um, I have a very, uh, loose understanding of what the estimated system is, uh, if you read through the menus, how the autofocusing system works, um, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, which autofocus settings would you suggest for birds in flight or uh, for photography, three or four? We'll talk about that too. Uh, MC, um, S5 Mark II owner, I uh, shoot just weddings using One Area Plus. Recent weddings had the box on the bride, slightly moved, uh, and I assume it says, and uh, bam, it locked to the guest behind her. Yep, we'll, we'll talk about some recommendations for how to do, how to work in situations like that as well. Um, cool, all right. We're gonna um, we're gonna dive into some of this first, and then because uh, I have a good mark where I know I left off on the questions, and then we'll jump back in and cover some of those questions uh, as we move through this. So to start with, um, as as we talked about, we're talking about the uh, all of the updates that we have in the G9 Mark II uh, and the focusing system, trying to uh, you know clarify how the system works. Uh, what kind of recommendations I make to many people for getting the best out of the system for you, depending on various different scenarios. So to start with, um, let's actually just kind of like do this as a building blocks thing, right? So let's talk about the autofocus modes. Now, for those of you that um, have used our cameras before, or even if it's something that you're looking to get into it, you drop right into our uh, AF modes by pressing the AF selector button in the back, which on a G9 Mark II or the S5 Mark II or S5 Mark II X, that's right in the middle of the rear AF uh, speed or AF um, continuous single or manual selector. So once you press that, you're going to get dropped right into the quick access for these options. And I'll show you the other way to get into this as well. And what you'll notice is that you have a number of different options here. So we have the pinpoint, which is all the way to the right and grayed out currently, and I'll explain why that is later. Uh, we have the one area, one area plus, zone, then there's a line 
uh, zone as well. And you have full area and tracking. Now, for each of these particular modes, with modern uh, deployment of things like subject detection in cameras, you can now start to think of AF modes as more uh, area of interest that you want the system to be looking at. Because these cameras all have uh, the newer cameras, G9 Mark II, S5 Mark II, and S5 Mark IIx, because they all have phase hybrid autofocusing, this means that the system will use those uh, boxes or those areas that you're defining to activate those focus uh, options that are within that, that zone or that point. All of this is uh, a little bit, um, a little bit different when it comes to one area. Uh, so the solid, just one area. Um, the regular one area, you'll notice that you can actually go in, you can change the sizes. And with this, it's basically all of the autofocus points that are within the box there are what you're going to see uh, and have active. Uh, and let me just turn off the um, frame markers here so that we have a cleaner display. So what you can see here is that I can move the size of the box. I can make it relatively big uh, comparative to the image uh, that you're capturing, and I can make it relatively small. Now in the video modes with this, you have a kind of free moving box that allows you to kind of position it where you want uh, and adjust to be able to grab focus where you, know, you want it to go. But if I were to put this camera into the photo mode, uh, which again, yeah, good. It doesn't break my, my switcher. So now if I put this into photo mode and we see here that I am in that one area detection mode, you'll see that I also have an option to go even one stop smaller with the autofocus boxes here. Now what this does, uh, and it's a little faint to see on the screen here, but there are little dots that show up on the screen when you move this uh, selector. What this is doing now is this is actually isolating the autofocus to that individual phase hybrid point instead of using a group of points. Now this can be excuse me, this can be incredibly beneficial if you're trying to be very precise with where you want or which focus point you want activated for your focusing. If you come from the DSLR era where you had maybe like nine points total and they were in a cross on the ground glass through, looking through the uh, OVF, the same logic here. You're going to pick which point you want. That's what it's going to use to activate for focusing. And that's going to give you a very precise uh, way to actually focus with the system. But as I said, that only works in the photography side. When you jump to the video side, and good, it did not break my, uh, my switch, and I have to plug in my light. Sorry for this, folks. My light died. That's what I get for not charging it before. So, um... What you basically get here is that the, the system changes slightly between photo and video. In the uh, video mode, you'll see that it's a much more freely moving box, and you don't have that extra one level drop in to specifically select one individual point, and there's a reason behind this. So, that's how one area goes, and we'll talk about the reason in a minute. Then, we have one area plus. Now, there was a comment uh, in the chat from MC that was mentioning about using One Area Plus. And if you notice, the actual icon and the way this system works is going to be very different than One Area. So, where One Area is only using the information that is within this box, so it will only activate on what is actually bound within that, whether it's the actual pinpointed uh, PDAF point or it's the surrounding contrast region, which is what the free movement of this allows you to select, that will be very different than how One Area Plus functions. One Area Plus, you'll notice, has two separate boxes. You have that inner box that looks like One Area, and then you have an outer bracket box, which is One Area Plus. Now, this particular mode is designed to give a wider area of coverage so that if you're in a situation, think sports, fast moving objects, wildlife, where maybe you're used to using a kind of more defined singular area to focus with, 
this external bracket gives you flexibility that if you can't keep that target right on your subject, which is very possible, it gives you a buffer zone that will assist to keep the focus within a certain region. Now, as uh, the one question was brought up about, you know, you're using one area plus in a wedding, the box was on the bride, and when the, when the bride moved, it jumped to another target. That is one of the things that the one area plus uh, has a possibility of having happen because if as you're going through and you've got your subject there, if the subject moves just out of range or is just on the edge of the box or even shifts out and you've got another target that's right there within the same subject detection, you can have situations, and this is true for all cameras, you can have situations where the, because the camera doesn't know exactly which subject you want because you're letting subject detection work there as well, the subject can, detection can jump right to that target instead because you're telling the system it's okay to look at that whole box. So the center box as primary, but then that outer box as kind of a safety zone to be looking at. So in a case like that, where maybe you're, you're photographing or you're uh, creating video uh, videos for a wedding, this is where I can recommend in various different scenarios. The One Area Plus can work really well for a lot of cases, but in many times using One Area tends to be a little bit better uh, for that particular style of shooting because you're not telling the system that it can use the area just outside of the box and I don't have the exact range that it, it looks out at, um, but it's, it's telling it, okay, ignore everything outside of this box and only activate within this. So if you have those situations where the bride or the groom or um, the subject that you're trying to capture moves to the edge of it, it doesn't run into where it starts using the supporting pixels around that for uh, the focusing there. So that's a little difference between uh, the one area and one area plus. Uh, you'll also notice that one with One Area Plus, uh, you're a little more limited in the size that you can make this uh, box appear. Uh, and that is because, like we said, it is also still activating uh, the areas that are in that bracket as kind of a feathered area around it. And this is all more of a support to help make sure that if you can't keep the box directly on a subject, uh, you've got a little bit of a buffer. This is something that was done years ago in DSLR eras as well. Um, usually you had some of these uh, systems where it would work and it would it would go just outside of it. And it was very much a sports photography kind of uh, focusing mode. Uh, but adding it in with this can be a very useful thing for various different subjects. It's just a matter of playing around with each one to know which mode works best in your particular scenario. And in some cases, that may mean changing between the different modes depending on the subject you're trying to photograph or create video for. Uh, the next one up on our list here is the zone autofocus. Now, zone, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, zone, you have three choices within our system on the newer cameras. You've got the large, uh, medium, and then a small kind of more, um, it's an octagon for it. Uh, and basically what these are doing, again, these are just giving you a region of interest to say only activate the autofocus pixels that are within this zone box. So when I photograph like motorcycles and cars, I'm using the zone most of the time. Uh, and then I'll use in conjunction with the subject detection options because this gives me an area of interest that I want to work with so that I can kind of pre-plan where I want. I know roughly where I want my subject to be within my framing. And if I want to utilize a subject detection, it will activate when they go in and touch that particular uh, zoned area that I've got called out here. And the cool thing with zone is that zone also works really well with wildlife and birding photography um, as well as sports photography, uh, mainly because it's a way to help in situations where, like I said, with the other two modes, if being able to keep a smaller target on your subject is a little difficult because of either the type of subject that you're photographing or videoing, um, or maybe just it's just not a skill that maybe you've got honed at this point, um, moving into zone is kind of one of the like safest, you know, I, what I would say like standardized ways uh, to work with. So again, 
Uh, for wildlife, things like that, zone is probably the based uh, AF mode that I would recommend having your camera set in and then adjusting it size-wise based on uh, which kind of subject you're going to want to work with. Um, there are certain situations where maybe you want more refinement over exactly which point, and that's where you start to go to one area plus or one area. Uh, and in cases like that, usually it's more for not, uh, you know, non-burden flight or when you have kind of multiple subjects within the frame. Switching to one area can help isolate out more instead of using the zone area, which if you've got three or four birds in there, uh, in the wildlife case, uh, you'd have subject detection running for all of them. So that's the zone uh, system there. Then we have the horizontal zone, uh, which isn't active during the video recording. This is only a photo option uh, piece here. So this is just more of a way to program in a specific area that you want to have active for focusing. Um, usually it tends to be used more in the creative side in photography. So more like art style photography, um, potentially street photography, because you'll know, okay, if I've got my, uh, vertical zone or a horizontal line that I'm, I'm kind of watching, this is the plane where I want, you know, the focus to be, I'm able to set that up. And then as my subject comes into it, like I I've used it a decent amount in street photography, I can have that set up so that the second anything comes right onto that plane that's where the focus is active vertical. Typically if I'm doing street photography and I'm capturing, you know, people as they're walking down the street or I'm walking past them, that kind of thing. Horizontal. If I'm doing more like uh, kind of landscape kind of work where I'm waiting for something to happen uh, framing wise on a lower or higher part of the, f excuse me, the frame. Then we switch over to the full area. Now full area. Uh, if you are just using full area as a standalone, you're not using any subject detection, full area is literally using all 779 autofocus points and all 315 um, contrast zones for the, detect, uh, for the focusing system. If you are not giving the camera any kind of subject information or any kind of tap on the screen to highlight an area, this system is going to focus on whatever it wants to focus on. Um, and that's true for pretty much any system that uses a full area or the entire, you know, system of, of focus points. Uh, with many of the modern cameras, while they've gotten very good at subject detection and we've gotten incredibly good at being able to, you know, understand what a subject looks like and give you the tools to be able to select them, the base functions of autofocus, if you are not giving them any kind of parameter, you are letting the system decide what it thinks it should be focusing on for you. And the truth of the matter is that the vast majority of the time, it's probably, it's, it may pick the things that we are thinking in our head with our intent. But if you don't give it any kind of input, it's going to focus on what it can focus on first. Um, so like if I half press, we're focused here. Yes, it's focused on my S1R here, but that's just because it's the largest thing in the frame. Uh, if I move the cameras, if I bring up like my old G9 here, you'll see that it, well, I'm actually also closer than the 42.5 Noctocron's focusing point, so that's a little different. Um, if I bring this up here, you'll see like, okay, hey, I'm pulled up front a little bit closer now, but when I bring it out, it's going to stay kind of where that point was because that's what it's looking at. It's got something in focus. It's using the full area and it's got a confirmed focus point. So this is where going in and actually selecting one of the other areas gives you that extra control to say, Hey, I don't want you guessing what I want to focus on. I know what I want to focus on. So go to that area. Um, the difference here is when you use the subject detection, which we're going to talk about once we go over the last uh, option here. Now, uh, what we'll see here is that the last option on this is the tracking option. Now, the tracking option, you're going to get a box uh, that looks like one area, one area plus kind of, but you get a little bit of a crosshair in it. Now, you can't change the size of this box but it lets you kind of go through and move it and control it just like you would have with the one area, one area plus. Now what this mode is, is this is the mode designed for actually looking at the visual components of the image for tracking. 
So this will, you can combine this with subject detection, but this is more of like an object tracking uh, mode. Now in the past, before we started putting in a lot of these various different options for things like subject detection, this would be how we used to do subject tracking because you would put this box over your subject, you would lock it in, you see that the box changes and as I move the camera around, that box stays there and keeps on that subject. That's how we used to do it. Now with subject detection, it partially makes in many cases these kinds of dedicated tracking modes not totally obsolete because you still have objects that aren't part of subject detection uh, algorithms that are being used but it makes it a little less likely to be the first choice for a lot of cases um, as an example if i'm doing you know the motorcycle photography nine out of ten times like i said i'm using zone as what i primarily want to use with it Every once in a while, I'll be using the, the tracking mode here because I want to actually lock onto the motorcycle. But now with the G9 Mark II, I don't really have to worry about that anymore because now we have a subject detection for motorcycles, which now just means I can leave it in zone and I don't have to worry about that anymore. So that's kind of the overall coverage of like, okay, what do the actual AF modes mean? The only one that I didn't cover there was the pinpoint. Now, Pinpoint only works in single autofocus. Uh, it does not work in continuous, and it is not something that's used in the video side. Pinpoint is literally going to go down to the specific pixel. Uh, in many of the cases here, really which of the PDAF uh, pixels you're using, and it'll give you a punch in for confirmation of focus. It's a lot slower of a method to work with, so it's something that you would use in a more deliberate sense. Uh, to lock in, you know, if you're doing macro photography and you really want to lock in on, say, like, um, I don't know, the, the tiny little bug sitting on, on a flower. Um, and it's kind of cliche. But if you wanted to focus on that and you want to use the autofocusing system, I would probably recommend, one, using autofocus single. Um, autofocus single on our system, you're going to get a, a very accurate, fast focusing um, because in that case, we're using the DFD system. And that will give you a lock-in real quick. And with the uh, pinpoint autofocus, you'll get a magnification and it will use a smaller zone to lock in and confirm that focus. Uh, video side, you typically don't need it because you're focusing more in the area that you're trying to keep the focal plane uh, for that particular video. So, um, MC, as kind of a recap there for MC... Uh, one of the first things, as you mentioned, you're using one area plus, I would recommend trying one area instead and not letting the system have that out outer bounding box uh, to try to also mitigate situations where maybe it jumps to another target because it falls within the parameters of the, the subject. Um, that also isolates out the subject detection better as well. Um, Paul, we're going to get to your question in a little bit. Uh, let's just double check. There were a couple more questions that came in here. Um, let's see here. Uh, I had video autofocus uh, focusing on the face. When the actor had some movement in his hands, the focus shifted to hands and face, becoming out of focus. Um, yeah, we, we've gotten that commentary before um, about basically uh, what I guess some people would call like the presentation mode, like being able to put something up and have it, you know, move to that person's, uh, move to the hands. Um, depending on which option you've got, if you're using face and eye, if you're using the human body, it will use different parts of the image to, to determine where the focus point is. Uh, now, as you can see, I use continuous focus on an S5 Mark II. I've used it since we released the camera. Um, depending on how I've got myself set up, you can see like even here, I've got hands in front of my face and it's not jumping to my hands. Now you can help this by changing some of the various different settings that you have within the, the menu. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, after we talk about the subject, uh, detection, uh, options that you have in the camera, because that can probably help you with when you have a subject or a person that's, you know, are you filming someone talk to camera and maybe they're more, you know, kind of movement with their hands. Uh, or an object, uh, but maybe you still want to retain it for when maybe, you know, you do more of a deliberate, like, hey, look at this, and then you want to have it come back. Um, I'll 
show you how I tune for particularly what I'm doing in the stream uh, because I got out of having some of those uh, challenges very early uh, with the system here. Uh, let's see here. Uh, there are a couple other questions that came in. Um, Buck says, any way to repair an MDT file on Mac? It's originally an MOV from BGH1. When I try to use the repair tool in S52X, it says it's not repaired. Uh, it will not repair MP4. No early S series to try uh, the Panda tool. So uh, we do have the video repair uh, tool that can be downloaded. Um, it is a Windows only uh, program, unfortunately. Uh, so I know what some people do, uh, when you're running on a Mac is either running like something like parallels, uh, or, um, you could try other programs, uh, like Wondershare and some of those others out there. Um, usually in cases like that, you would need to have a reference file, uh, that has the same, uh, frame rate, same, you know, bit rate selected, uh, and a clip that's usually at least a couple seconds so that it can rebuild some stuff. Um, but yeah, be taking it from one camera to put it into another is probably not going to work because the cameras that do have it built in, um, it's based on understanding that camera in particular and the markers that like the camera maker notes for that particular camera. Um, yeah, it's kind of how it is. Uh, Paul says, do both batteries charge through USB C if battery grip is fitted with the uh, battery in the G9 Mark II? Uh, unfortunately, no. On the G9 Mark II, the batteries have to be charged uh, in the body. Only the grip doesn't uh, attach uh, for charging there. It's the same on the S5 II and the S5 IIX. Um, let's see here. Uh, you have to activate the subtitles in French and know that it's not just English people who follow you. Uh, I can double check the back end of YouTube. Um, a hundred percent know that we have a global, uh, uh, audience here. Um, my understanding, unless something's changed in the background in the back end of, uh, the, uh, platform, it should offer the automatic translations for your region, but I, I can a hundred percent double check for you. Jennifer says, no questions, just grateful for these streams. Many greetings from, uh, Austria. Well, welcome. It's awesome to, to see so many people from abroad here. Um, Derek, uh, can you explain how to set tap to focus on the camera screen? Uh, is it different? Is it different for different Lumix cameras? Um, yep. We're going to talk about that in a second. Uh, I have my focus set up for MC trails trials. Um, the only issue I have is getting it to focus very quickly for the next rider. I uh, wish the shutter button could be set to focus faster. Red button to focus faster. Red button for record. Um, so that the shutter button could be set for focus, uh, red button for record. Um, so I, I assume you're doing video recording then, uh, with that particular setup. Um, so with something like this, I uh, well, let's, let's talk about the different, uh, focus modes that we have, uh, for the speed here as well. So we'll be able to get you some, some information about that. Maybe it'll, it, it might give you some, some ideas to try there for you. Um, let's see here. Uh, am I crazy or is autofocus slower or less confident? If that makes sense on my older 12 to 70 lens on my G9 Mark II. Uh, is the motors being developed, uh, is the motors being developed since, or perhaps a firmware update? Uh, 12 to 70? I would think you mean 12 to 60. Um, so a couple things with, uh, focusing speeds in general with various different lenses. Um, one, definitely check the website. We have a firmware link down in the, the description for where our firmware, uh, files are housed. Make sure you're running the most, like the latest firmware on the lens that you have. Um, if there is no firmware update for the lens you have, um, it's possible that it's a much older lens. Uh, it's also possible that that lens may not be like a hundred percent compatible with the newer systems. And what I mean by that is kind of what you mentioned in the second part of uh, the question there is that as lenses have gotten more advanced over excuse me, over the years, lens development has gotten better. Motor development has gotten better. Um, that means that, you know, the faster things need to run, 
um, the compatibility that's needed, the information that's needed to be communicated between the lens and the camera, that changes over time. Um, earlier systems, uh, like if you go way back uh, to like the 7 to 14 millimeter, it was one of the earliest micro four thirds lenses from our lineup. Um, when you look at that lens compared to something like the 8 to 18, similar class lenses, both ultra wide angle, uh, zooming, one is yes, the Leica series, one is not. But the focus motor technology between those two lenses is pretty vastly different. And what that means is that the 8 to 18 is going to perform better on the newer cameras versus the 7 to 14, which will perform adequately, but the newer lenses will be able to perform much faster um, through various different optic design changes that have happened over the years, the motor choices that have happened over the years, the communication protocols that have updated throughout the years. Um, just because uh, an older lens optically has no problem doesn't mean that it may have the hardware required to communicate fast enough or even just move the lens fast enough with how how fast things have gotten these these days so um it's possible that you're not like like that you're seeing what it is that you're seeing like i, I i'm not i, I don't want to say that you're not seeing that but uh depending on what lens it is Typically, anything past the, uh, I would say, like, the introduction of the updated Leica series, you're going to be pretty fine. Like, I run the 42.5 Noctocron on my G9 Mark II, and it focuses fast, so. Um, and if there are differences, you may be, it may be, like, splitting hairs in really what the speed difference is. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of where, where I would say about that, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Uh, could you give a brief walkthrough about the focus stacking mode? Um, if we have time at the end of the stream, we will. Um, let's see here. Uh, this one I do want to address because I did get this one before. Uh, when you mount a fully manual lens, no electronics, no EXIF, on the G9 or G9 Mark II, both ask you to enter focal length. Uh, is that the actual focal length, uh, for the normal lens or the 135 equivalent? It is the actual focal length. Cameras don't care about equivalency. This is one of the probably bigger frustrating things out there. Equivalency doesn't matter to a camera. The lens you put on it, the lens that I have, the 42.5 Noctocron that's on this camera is a 42.5 Noctocron. If I throw my adapted um, 35 millimeter Leica lens on any of my cameras, as I almost drop it, uh, if I throw this on there, it's a 35 millimeter because that is what the lens is. It is a 35 millimeter. Um, so when you're going to tell the camera what the focal length is that you're going to put on there, if it's a lens designed for micro four thirds that you're just adapting on there, just put the focal length that the lens is. Um, you don't have to do the conversion. Um, some lenses, when you go super telephoto, I've had some things uh, where certain longer telephoto lenses actually perform better if I do like, and it's a 35 millimeter full frame lens that I cut the field, uh, cut the, um, focal length in half and put that in the camera. But nine out of 10 times, you're not really going to see much of a difference there. Um, really more on the ultra wide angle lenses is where I'd say it probably becomes more critical. Um, but yeah, just enter what's on the lens, uh, for it. So uh, let's see here. Uh, will multiple exposure, uh, dual exposures make a return to the S5 II and G9 Mark II? You love it on the S5. Um, I wish I had an answer on that one. Um, I've asked before. I haven't got one from our team either. Uh, will the S5 II get the same or similar AF features? We've asked this before. Even if I did know, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Um... If I get a camera today, do I directly jump to the latest firmware or do I have to install all the previous ones in order? Um, you just install the one that's currently on the website. Um, our firmware update, uh, the way they work, they're collective. So right now, like uh, G9 Mark II is on version 2.1. Just install 2.1. You're going to get all the updates from 2.0. If you, for whatever reason, have a camera that's at 1.0 firmware, um, you just have the, the setup there. So... Um, Marlene, hi. Uh, does using the AF on button for back button focus work with pre-burst? Uh, I have done some tests myself, but they weren't conclusive. Basically, does using back button focus act like a half press? 
I uh, this is a good one. I I have not really dove into back button focusing in many many years. Um, it's not one that I've uh, really ever had a lot of experience working with. I've always been a just use the shutter button for it. Um, but the back button focusing system on our camera, um, it does work. Uh, it, it functions like it. The thing that often I think gets, uh, I'd say probably missed, uh, when looking at setting up back button focus on the camera is that a lot of times, uh, and if I remember where it is in this menu, um, shows you how often I've, I've had to go in and use this. Um, so here it is in many times when you're using back button focus, a lot of times people won't turn shutter AF off. And the thing is, is that if you leave shutter AF on and you're pressing the uh, rear button, the, uh, AF, AF on button for focus, and then you press the shutter button, you could be overriding that, uh, and telling the camera to focus also, or to stop focusing. Um, because you've got those two separate, um, controls there for it. So usually what I recommend, um, and I don't know if this is something that, that you've done with it, Marlene. Um, but yeah, going to shutter a off AF and turning this off will disable that, that AF button on the shutter button so that it will not activate. You have to use rear. Um, and from what I've been told from a couple people that, I, that have asked me about this before, that seems to correct any kind of challenges they may have with it. Um, but it is something that I'll look at maybe uh, covering over the next couple of weeks while we got to do some recorded streams. So, okay, let's talk about subject detection here um, because we were, uh, you know, we already went through the AF modes. Um, so now let's let's dig in here with uh, subject detection. So there's a couple ways that you can get into it uh, on the newer cameras. So for one is going into the menu, whether you're in the photo or the video menu, um, it'll be the same option here. And you'll see AF detection settings. If you turn this on, your AF detection is going to be turned on for the detection there. Now, detecting subjects, this is where you'll be able to come in and say, hey, which subjects do I want to work with? So in the G9 Mark II, you'll see that we have human, animal, car, and motorcycle. Now, for car and motorcycle, obviously these are primarily trained, the models that are used are primarily trained on motorsports or racing vehicles or motorcycles, like more racing motorcycles. Um, that means that they'll work pretty well for general day-to-day -day automobiles and motorcycles, but sometimes you may see that like maybe a giant tractor trailer might not get as recognized, uh, same as a, a passenger vehicle. So this is one of the ways that you can select your different detection modes, uh, your subject or what you want to detect. Uh, you can come in, select which one you want. And if you'll notice from like an S5 Mark II or an S5 Mark II X, we've split out the human and animal. One of the biggest things that we got commentary about with the S5 Mark II and the Mark II X, and honestly, our system prior to that was cool that you can do animals, great that you can do humans, but having them together means that in some cases, the display can become overwhelming because you've got animals being with, uh, drawn with boxes over them and you've got people and there's just a lot going on. So we've changed the system up based on the commentary we've gotten from the vast majority of people that have uh, voiced their opinions about it and we've split it out into the different modes here. So animal and human. Once you select the option that you want to work with, you then have the target part of the subject. In this case, we're looking at human. So then when I go into here, you'll see that you have the human body, which is eye, face, and body. That's the entirety of the, the human form. Uh, this is the one that if your subject, as they walk farther away, it'll go from eyes to head to body, and then back the other way as they get closer. If they turn around, it'll go to the back of the head. Um, this is what's the all-encompassing one here. If you change this to just eye and face, in our system, the eye and face is literally just the eye and face. If the subject turns and looks away from the camera and you lose the eye and face, it's going to drop back to whatever AF mode you have the camera set into. So, and I'll explain why that's important in a minute. Then you also have, uh, as I said, if we go into animal detection, you have target part for animal. You have body which is, this is the 
typical way that we've been doing animal detection for the vast majority of the time that our cameras have had animal in it. Uh, this will just put a box over the animal. You'll be able to detect multiple animals. Um, this will bias the system towards the animal's head, but it's not a guarantee that it's going to go towards the head. Now we have the eyes and body. This is the one that it will detect the body. When an eye is detected within the area that you are looking to, for recognition, it will jump to the eye. When the eye becomes obscured or the animal looks away, it will go back to the body and it will do this seamless. And the way our UI is designed is that when an eye is detected, it won't show you the box over the body. It will just show you the box over the eye. When the eye is not seen, it will drop back to giving you the box on the body. Now, this, is, this was a design from feedback of users that said, hey, just tell me what you're focusing on. I don't want to know, like, hey, I've got the box and I've got an eye. Cool, which one am I focusing on? It just tells you exactly which area you're on. If only the eye box is shown, that's the, where it's going to focus. If the box is shown, it's not seeing an eye, it's going to focus on the body with a preference towards the head of the subject. Uh, and then, as you can see here on the G9 Mark II, uh, the car and the motorcycle don't have individual target parts that you can target with it. It's just a global car and motorcycle detection option. So, with all of that being said, when we go back into the quick menu option here for selecting your autofocus, you'll see that there's a couple other button configurations that you can do. When you're in this mode, you can press up to turn your subject detection on and off. And then you can also press the display button to drop right into that menu that we were using before in a slightly more accessible method to be able to come in and change what the various different parts are and how you want the system to work. And then the icon gets updated on this particular part of the screen here. Now, as I mentioned with the human face and eye detection as a good example for this, if you are using that particular mode, and let me change this camera for a minute. If you're using that particular particular mode and I'm filming like this, I'm literally going to have a box over my face and eyes. But if I do this, actually, let me do this. If I do this, that box will disappear. And what it will do is it's going to revert to whatever the AF mode is that you had set for that detection option. So when we go back to the camera and look at that, You'll see that in this case, I've got the camera set to the one area plus with subject detection on. And if I change this to the eye detection, again, you get the icon that changes accordingly. Here, you'll see now that if we use this, and unfortunately I don't have a subject I can have the subject detection pop up on. But what this means is that the subject detection is only going to activate in what is touching this box. Now, when the subject disappears, in that case, if I have this box over a human face and I'm using face and eye and that subject turns to where the eyes can't be seen anymore, it will fall back to use what is directly under that particular box. So that's where it becomes more critical that if you're using subject detection and you have a more complex scene, you can go in and give it basically what I call like a fallback if subject detection can't be seen. This is where, in some cases, you can run into some challenges, where if you are in full area, as you can see, full area pulled the lens for focus, not the back uh, S1R there. If you're in full area and your subject turns and looks away, camera could jump to whatever else it wants to see in focus because you're not giving it an input anymore. It doesn't know what you want to have it focus on. So full area, while very easy to work with, because once a subject comes into frame, cool, you've got your subject, it's going to jump to it, great. But if that subject leaves, you're trusting that the system's going to be able to understand what you want it to focus on. So that's where I highly recommend using things like zone, one area, one area plus, or even the tracking mode, uh, whether you're in photo or video, because at that point, you're telling the system, hey, Use the tools that you have built in to help me get the photo, recognize a subject, get to the point where I want it to go. But if that particular subject becomes obscured or it, uh, if it's like birds and wildlife, if it goes behind reeds to where uh, the full area now just doesn't know what it's looking at because there's no subject there anymore, this gives you the ability to say, hey, 
even if you don't see the subject, this is the zone that I want you to, to be focusing in. This is where I want you to, to concentrate your, your uh, focus point on. Ignore everything else happening around in the frame. So, highly recommend setting your camera up that way. Uh, set a base AF mode that works for your particular style of shooting. So, if that's going to be one, air, uh, uh, one area AF uh, for things like maybe wedding... One area plus if you're doing more things like motorsports or, um, you know, maybe some wildlife. Uh, if you're using this camera as a way to, like, capture family moments and you've got kids that run around or pets that run around, I highly recommend one area plus. Um, maybe even zone. Uh, but you go for maybe a little more fast, unpredictable motion is where you start jumping into one area plus and then into zone. Full area can work well in situations where maybe you want to have it functioned a little bit closer to like, say, uh, a point and shoot or more of just like a snap uh, kind of camera. Like, you're not really necessarily wanting to put in a ton of effort. You want the camera to kind of do some leg lifting for you. Set it into that. Um, if you're doing like maybe vlogging or self-filming type creation, uh, using full area can, can work in a case like that with uh, using full uh, human detection because... Then as you turn your head, it's still going to stay there. Uh, and then tracking for those situations where maybe you're going to be tracking a an object, um, but you can also still have your subject detection active even in the tracking mode. So hopefully some of that helps uh, in how the hierarchy of the system, excuse me, how the hierarchy of the system kind of works uh, in ways that maybe you can help isolate and give yourself a little more confidence in certain situations. Uh, Daniel says, just curious if there's an update on the preamp clicking noise with the S5 S5.2 S5.2X meant to tag at Lumix before. Um, so if you're having an issue where you think that the preamps are clicking on your camera, send it into service. Um, stuff like that. If you ever have potential challenges like that, or, uh, you think you might hear something with like an audio thing. Um, I know back in like, I think it's a GH4. Uh, someone had a, uh, someone pointed out something with like a hum or something in it. Yes. Send that stuff into service. Um, send it in right away kind of thing. Um, service team, that's what they're there for. I, uh, one of the kind of, I think in all honesty, most frustrating things about modern ways that we all communicate. And one of the reasons why I wanted to create this stream years ago is that I would see comments like this, like, Hey, what's going on with X, Y, or Z? And those comments are sitting on a Facebook forum. They're sitting in, you know, a Reddit chat. They're sitting in a Discord forum somewhere. And the truth is, is that if that's where those conversations are happening, the service teams, the company themselves, nine out of 10 times are never going to see those. So if they're not bring, being brought up to the company or sent into the company to be evaluated, excuse me, evaluated, then nothing can happen. Uh, it just becomes more of just a circular conversation within a closed garden there. Um, so if if you do have a problem with your camera, send them in for service. Um, to my knowledge, there is no issue. Um, but if you have, a, an, uh, if you're running into something like this, get it into your service team. Um, uh, 100%. Um, they're the ones that are going to be able to test the cameras, test the hardware, make sure that everything's working all right. Uh, and then you know, fix it if there's an issue for you. Yeah. Fielding says, uh, for non-detected subjects, landscape, stars, etc., uh, we should turn that setting off. Um, this is a good point. Uh, for things where you know you're not going to be using subject detections, like landscape photography, um, astrophotography, uh, even maybe some macro photography, if you're not doing, you know, uh, like animals, if you're doing more like still life objects, things like that. Um, yeah, turn subject detection off. Um, I mean, it's, it's not going to hurt it one way or another. If you have it on or you turn it off, it's really not going to hurt anything. Um, but yeah, I typically go through that process because it's pretty quick to just tap up on the directional pad. When I go in and change my focus mode, literally just pressing up on the four way directional pad in the back. Um, I will constantly just turn it on and off. And up in the uh, the top of the screen there, uh, what you'll notice is that when it's on in the top, uh, it's kind of like right over that way. 
uh, the icon changes. So it will change to say, and you'll see the little icon. It's better when you're looking through the viewfinder because the scaling on my switcher here. Um, it'll tell you if you have the detection mode turned on or not. So yeah, you can turn them off. It's not going to hurt it if you leave it on. So wouldn't really need to worry about that. Um, okay, yep, had that all set up properly for Marlene. I'll have to try again. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll have to take a look at it, uh, Marlene, for you, um, to see, like, what, what kind of, uh, like, how the process works. Like I said, I'm not the best at back button focusing. Uh, it's always felt awkward to me, so I usually can never tell, like, hey, is this working right or is this not? I usually lean on people that tend to use that a lot themselves, so... Uh, let's see here. Uh, other, okay, there's another tagged question. Uh, can we just tap and hold on the screen to lock focus regardless of which, uh, mode we are in? So, on the Lumix cameras, uh, the focusing system is a little different. Um, so, our system, you can tap and drag your focus point, which I'm doing here on the back of my, uh, G9 Mark II. So, I can tap and move it. Um, this isn't going to lock on the particular screen. Now, if I change in and I use the AF tracking mode, I can come in, move this particular point. When I let it go, it drops in and tracks that particular point. If I click again and I move it with my thumb, when I let go, it drops the tracking point on there. So this is an area where the tracking AF mode can still come in handy um, because I can move this put it over the subject that I'm trying to go for, and then it will actually activate the tracking for that once I let go on the screen. You don't have to tap and hold. Uh, it's just a matter of just moving the point, dropping it down, and then now you're there. So that, that can be a workaround for that particular um, type of setup. Um, I think it's Jean-Paul. So, uh, I also wanted to talk about here, um, the, let's set this back to... How I normally have the camera for there. Cool. So now let's talk quickly about the autofocus custom settings, because this was something that was mentioned earlier on, and this is definitely going to make an impact onto how your system works. So AF custom settings, you'll see that there are two different ways that this works. In video, it's AF custom settings video. You'll find it under the video tab. When you go down into set, you'll, you'll see that you'll have AF speed and AF sensitivity. Uh, sensitivity is the option of how locked on to a target is your system going to be. Uh, do you want it to be more responsive so that it can move through? And as new subjects come in, it goes to make a quick change. Or do you want it to stay more locked on, which means that it's going to be less likely to want to jump to a different target. Then you also have your AF speed. Now this is the speed at which the focusing system moves between subjects, between targets, between AF points. You can go really fast with it or you can go really slow with it. Now, one of the things that has come out over the years is that back when we were using solely the DFD system, users came up with various different kind of recipes that they recommended everybody use on their autofocusing systems. Like, you know, plus three, minus two, all of that kind of stuff. The reality is, is that if you applied those settings to the current uh, phase hybrid autofocusing system, you're really not in for a good time. Um, the way the system functions, because now you've got the phase detect system with our DFD system there, because we've got that much more information and it is that much faster, there were situations where even the people that I was working with that said, hey, what's up with the autofocus? I did this, doesn't seem to work. I tested on my side, everything's working fine. Then they say, well, I use the same AF custom settings I used from my GH5. There's your big problem. With this system, it is highly recommended. Start everything at zero. Because it is not a, you know, copy paste of types of settings because they are two fundamentally different autofocusing systems, you run into that kind of situation where if I were to just come in and say like, okay, this is how I'm going to have my autofocusing set up. Sure, for some people it may be really nice, 
But what you're setting here is that you're basically going to have this thing snap in and out of focus and you want it locked on a target. So it's going to be really uh, heavily locking to the subject that you pick, which means that it may stay really heavily locked. But then when it does want to change, it changes real fast. And a lot of times that's not the look people want to go for. You want a confident it changes when you put a new subject in. You want the speed to be, you know, pretty quick, but maybe not like lightning snapping fast because there are certain situations where that looks terrible. Um, but you also don't want it overly slow. Some people have told us that they think that our autofocusing speed is too fast for what they want to work with. So being able to come in here and play with these different settings, uh, specifically the speed, every single one that you move this plus one or minus one is one of those things where you're going to want to take time, go through a different way of shooting with the camera, shoot a bunch of clips, change these settings one by one, take kind of more of a scientific approach to it and look and see what each one of these changes is doing to your footage because they make a lot more difference now than they did back with the DFD systems. Now, when you look at the photo functionality on the camera, and we'll switch back into the photo modes here, when I go into the photo modes, you'll see the AF custom settings are a bit different than the video modes. In So this is the video mode. Now, if I go to my photo mode, you'll see that I have sets now. I have one, two, three, and four. Now, each of these are tuned differently. So set one is how the camera is going to come out of the box when you first power it on, put a card in it, and start playing around with it. Set one is designed to be generic. Uh, this means that those of you that may be using the system and really pushing it hard with real fast action and real fast motion, so wildlife photographers, you're probably not going to be happy with this on set one. Uh, set one is probably not going to be the fastest setting for you. Uh, you'll probably find and say like, hey, you know, this was supposed to be such a, a fast or big improvement from what we've had. What am I missing? This is nine out of 10 times the culprit. Uh, if you just get the camera and you just take it right out of the box and you start going to shoot with it. The reason for that is that because speed and sensitivities can be so customized and the various different requirements for various different use cases are so different, there really isn't a like one size fits all for autofocusing. I don't care what camera brand you use. It is not a one size fits all. There are reasons that all the camera brands are allowing some control over these systems. The difference is what the default is and what the average user is going to kind of take away from the camera. So for general here, it's got some moderate push on the subject prediction uh, that we have built into the cameras. So that's being left at a, a plus one. But you'll see that your switching sensitivity and your AF sensitivity are all designed basically middle of the road. Um, and that's what we, we say. It's a very versatile, it's a basic setting. It's something that, you know, for many people, it's going to be good. For some people, you're going to want to actually go in there and do some customization with it. Set two for subjects that are going in a singular direction and moving at a constant speed. So trains, airplanes, you know, drag racing cars, stuff like that. Um, this is, you'll notice that the mix here changes. You're getting mo uh, motion subject, uh, moving subject prediction is staying at zero. Switching sensitivity is staying more locked on, but the speed is becoming more responsive. This is what our engineers have gone through and said after, th you know, through testing, through working with photographers that are sh photographing these kinds of settings. This is where they've kind of set their levels at for what they want to focus on and how they want the system to work. So those become the defaults. Then you've got set three, uh, subject moves randomly, other objects may be in the scene. So we use football and basketball as a reference here, but this can very much be, you know, wildlife. You've got birds that are flying, you know, behind the trees, coming out of the trees, flying in and out of a blind. There are mitigating or there are circumstances that can happen that obscure the subject from where you are, but you want it to stay on that particular subject, especially if they're moving. So this is where your sensitivity stays much more locked on. Your switching speed stays up a little higher. 
and your moving subject prediction stays more variable. So what this means is that the system's gonna be looking and saying, okay, the subject is not moving at a regular pace. They may be making quick different movements. So it needs to be accounting for that as it moves through. So that's what set three is. And then set four, you'll see there's a very little difference between set three and set four. Set four is where the subject's speed changes significantly. So that's really where you go into motorsports, cars, motorcycles, things like that. That's where your sensitivity is being set to zero versus the minus one on the set three. So what does all of this mean? For various different situations, um, I can tell you out of the box, I set my camera to set three. That's my kind of day in, day out use of the camera. Um, I find that it works really well for street photography, for that kind of amateur wildlife work that I do. Um, I've been told from other users that set three seems to perform very well for them with their wildlife and sports photography. Um, set four is the one that I will go to when I am photographing motorcycles because I typically know where they're going to be. I know the speeds that they go. Uh, and as the thing says, speed changes pretty erratically in certain cases. So having that a uh, slight little tweak there helps. Uh, if you're going to be changing around various different you know, ways that you want to shoot, you have always that access into this to constantly change it. And say, you know, you work with, uh, you know, the wildlife settings, but you say like, hey, you know, I want this to actually stay a little bit more locked on uh, than what we've set as default. That's why each of these parameters can be customized so that it's not set to just have to say like, hey, this is what, you know, we've set the system to. You're not locked into it. You have the ability to come in and still change this and tweak it so that it fits your particular style of shooting. Uh, it's a couple more comments uh, came in here. Uh, Marlene says, no question, uh, no worries. A question I got from your YouTube videos. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll definitely look into it um, and connect with you, uh, Marlene, about that. Um... What's here? Um, Ron, not sure if I heard a clear solution for the wedding uh, bride example. In that case, are we to use tracking? Uh, that's one thing that you can do. Um, for the wedding bride uh, scenario that was brought up before, this is where I would recommend either using one area if it's a very busy uh, scene and you really know that you just want to focus on the bride or the groom or the one subject. Um, the other option can be the tracking. Um, the tracking is going to be a little more, I'd say, challenging to work with um, because in order to do the like select where you tap and then it, it selects and locks on, especially if you're doing video, um, to do that, you have to use the rear touch screen to do it. You can't use the joystick to move it around. Um, so that can be a bit challenging for a number of reasons when it comes to video or, uh, yeah, when it comes to video capture. Um, so yeah, I honestly, you can, you can try doing this, but you have to remember to have like touchpad AF turned on, uh, if you use the, uh, uh, LCD. Uh, for setting your focus point or just use one area not one area plus with your subject detection uh, and that should help you out now for the photography side uh, one little bonus uh, piece before uh, I have to wrap for today um, so let me go back into the photo mode uh, yeah let's do this in aperture priority so we're set here. Uh, for burst photography, uh, there was the question uh, much earlier in the stream asking about the um, how the SH-1 and 2 versus how mechanical, uh, how the focusing system basically kind of works at a higher level. So when we set our focusing system, you have a couple of different ways that um, the system can work as a whole within the system. And I'm just trying to get into where the, um, uh, the option is for it. I was looking at this right before the stream, and I can't believe I'm forgetting where it is. There it is. So uh, there's a couple things to kind of keep in mind. Uh, with with the focusing systems, you'll see that by default, 
your autofocus and shutter priority from a stills perspective are going to be set up like this. Your AFS is going to be set to prioritize focus. AFC is going to be set to prioritize balanced. Now balanced uh, means that it's going to, it's going to take into account and balance out whether or not the camera is 100% in focus or it's within the range of like what depth the field is going to cover basically. Or you can tell it to just say like, I don't care. Just make sure that you can release shutter. Um, you have a couple ways that you can play around with this. I said by default, it's going to be in balanced. Usually with my camera, I change this to focus um, because I don't want the camera taking a picture unless it tells me it's got a confirmed focus point. Um, even in continuous, this can be pretty, pretty beneficial. But when you go into the various different burst modes for the camera, so that's the first thing I'd set. With the burst modes of uh, the cameras, what you'll see is that we have the high burst mode, so high, medium, and low, and these are mechanical. The mechanical means that these are going to be basically every single frame is being um, uh, focused every single individual time. So it's using the, the, the every single individual piece. Then when you look at the SH series, so SH-20, SH-60, SH-75, but SH-75 is single focus only. These modes, the focusing system switches from a photographic-based focusing system to the video-based-ish system. And I say ish because it's not exactly that. What that means is that when we say estimated, it means that the system is always going to be moving. So it uses our motion prediction, it uses the subject detection, uh, and it uses all the algorithms that we have built in with the PDAF system to judge where the focus is going, where it's going to be stopping at, how fast it should move between those different positions, and that is the part that makes this so much more imperative for photo and video uses, being able to come in and change these parameters. Because when you're using the SH series, this stuff is going to have a much bigger impact on how fast do you want the system to run? How fast do you want it to change between subjects? What type of uh, kind of algorithm do you want to use? That's why we give you a bit of control in with these different settings to be able to set what is going to work best for your particular style of shooting. As I said, if you're just setting it in burst mode and you've got it set into the basic or set one, you may be going into certain situations where you've got, you know, fast action and the system's not expecting to have to really crank the system fast. It's thinking because of what the inputs it's being given, this is a general basic level of focus, you know, could be some running, could be some, you know, kind of uh, driving in a car, that kind of stuff, walking, vlogging, stuff like that. But when you have those kind of use cases that are what I would call out of the niche of an everyday use case. And what, what I mean by everyday use case is like, I've got a camera, I carry it with me every day, and I just want to take snaps. That would be considered a general everyday use case. So that means that wildlife, sports, um, motorsports, that kind of stuff, they're all fringe cases. Not that they, it's not a reflection of the size of the market. It's that from an average everyday person, they're not going to be photographing birds, wildlife, stuff like that in the same level that some of you do. You would need to go in and say, hey, I want the camera to focus much faster, so I need to go to set three. That will, that will affect how the SH speed performance is, that even affects how the mechanical burst performance is as well. It's just a matter of how much it uses the actual algorithms that we've built in, whether it leans on them harder or it leans on the, um, the direct data uh, every single shot. And it's just gonna depend on whether or not you're in SH or you're in mechanical shutter mode. Um, last but not least, uh, Jean-Paul uh, says, can we talk about focus bracketing mode uh, with an example if possible? So, focus bracketing, um, and this is the last piece that I've got for today before I have to wrap up. So, fo focus bracketing is possible within the Lumix cameras. Um, I just have to remember where it is. There it is. So, with focus bracketing on our cameras, you have the ability to do this right in the menu. 
And what you're going to do is go in, you'll come up to focus. You can go to more settings. You can set how many images you want to capture. So in this case, let's just say we're going to do 20 images. You can change your steps. Um, I have to be honest, I have not looked up what the steps actually indicate. Um, I have to go back and read the manual. And if the manual doesn't clearly tell me, I'll just check with one of our team uh, and then I'll share my findings with everybody. Um, but the steps, the greater the step, the bigger the difference is going to be between the um, individual photos. So it's going to let the motor move further. So in this case, let's just set three. Then the sequence. I typically start at zero and move out. So we're set there, right? So now we're going to be doing focus bracketing. So now let me change my focus point to what I prefer to use for this, which is one area. Let's bring this in. Let's start this bracket on there. And I would have to throw a memory card into this. Ow. Let's put a memory card into my camera. We're going to go in. Uh, I don't know where I used this memory card last, so we're going to format it. Really good process. If you put a memory card in a camera, you don't know what camera it was in last, and you're sure that there's no data on it, format the memory card. So now uh, I've got the bracket set up. We're ready to go, and I'm just going to click in here. And now we're doing the bracketing and you can see that it's moving the focus back through the camera there and it just took all 20 images. So now when I go to playback and hopefully this doesn't break the switch, there we go. You'll see that the focus bracket gets put into a group of photos that I can press down on and then I can cycle through those images, check through and see where they, uh, where they're moving through. And the coolest part, um, this is something that, uh, I don't know how many have actually ever used it before, but if you're in playback, you can go into your playback settings and then you can do magnify from AF point. So now, of course I hit the shutter button there. Now you're going to get a green box on where your uh, focus point is. Um, now in bracketing, it grabs the first point. So I can tell like right here, that's where I was focused. Uh, to start with, and then the bracket's going to move on from there. So that's how bracketing works uh, on the camera. But yeah, uh, let's see here. Uh, shutter closing while turn off. Is this possible to include in this function? Uh, probably not on these cameras. Um, shutter closing when the camera's off is still a 50-50 whether or not that's a good idea or bad idea. Um, it's kind of like the old uh, Animaniacs uh, thing. Good idea, bad idea. Um, so we've definitely heard a lot of the commentary about wanting to have the ability to have the shutter closed when the camera's turned off for things like changing lenses, stuff like that. Um, everyone always has to balance out, well, the risk to a sensor is much less than the risk to the shutter blades in a camera. Um, so a lot of that's got to get kind of figured out as to which is actually the better of the two. It's easy to just take a dust blower um, like one of those hand ones and blow dust off the sensor. It's a heck of a lot more expensive to repair a shutter mechanism if it gets damaged because it's closed and maybe when you're changing a lens, you the shutters. Okay. With that, everybody, I have to uh, unfortunately call it for today. Um, thank you all so much for tuning in. This was a fun one. Um, yes, it was very heavy on demonstration and going through the menus and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, but I wanted to make sure that that was out there because we've had a lot of people asking about that, you know, kind of a little bit more of an in-depth, how does this work? Where are these settings in the menus? Um, so hopefully uh, some of the things that you got um, kind of help. Hopefully you learned something new. Um, if you didn't, hopefully you at least enjoyed the conversation. Um, you know, we can't always learn something new every single stream. Um, but... I want to give everybody a little bit of a, a update for the next couple of weeks for the uh, for Lumix Live um, next week uh, and the follow actually for the next three weeks uh, we these will be pre-recorded uh, broadcasts. Um, we have NAB that is happening over the next two weeks. Um, we have to go in early uh, to actually set the show up. 
Then the following week is the actual show. Uh, so if you're going to be in Las Vegas, uh, be sure to swing by the Central Hall of the Las Vegas Convention Center. Uh, we are in the Panasonic Connect booth because we are one Panasonic. Uh, so be sure to come by, uh, check us out. Uh, Matt Fraser, myself, Neil Matsumoto will be there. Uh, we'll have uh, S5 Mark IIs, uh, S5 Mark IIx on display. We'll even have the DJI Ronin RS3 Pro there. Uh, so if you're going to be there and you've never seen the LiDAR system, if you've never seen how Active Track works, be sure to come by and check that stuff out. It's going to be a really fun show. Um, the following week, uh, we are also going to be recorded as Matt and I have, um, like I said, it's kind of a, it's personal away from the rest of what we're doing here, but we have some training events that we're doing. Um, cause every once in a while we, uh, get to go out and actually do some in-person events to train people on how to use our cameras. Uh, so we will be out for those, uh, those three weeks. We will be recording, uh, sessions. Um, if I have the possibility uh, and I'll try to notify everyone on, uh, uh, through YouTube's, uh, the posts that we can make. If I have the flexibility, I might try to come live to everybody from NAB, um, or at least do a recap from NAB. Um, so like while we're doing setup, cause usually we have a little bit better bandwidth in the hall during that point. Um, but I will keep everybody updated throughout the, um, posts for uh, our YouTube channel. Uh, outside of that, if you have recommendations for things that you want to see us cover over the next three weeks, um, realistically, the show's two weeks and three weeks from now, uh, drop them down in the comments after the video is posted. Um, I have a couple of ideas for things that I want to record for those, but if uh, someone submits something that's kind of just like, oh, this is a cool topic, I'll make sure to, to probably pick that one and give you credit and we'll, we'll uh, cover that topic. Um, other than that, thank you so much, everybody, again, for tuning in. If you liked the content, give us a like. Uh, if you don't already, uh, consider subscribing to the channel. It helps us. If you know people that may find interest in what we talk about in this community that we're building, make sure to share the video with them. Uh, the more interaction we get in the comments and the likes and the shares and all that kind of stuff, the better it does for these videos online and the more people we can reach, which means the more cool stuff we can do. Other than that, have an awesome rest of your day. Have an awesome weekend. Get out there, create stuff. Check us out online. Share your stuff with us all over the place. Tag at Lumix USA, all the normal stuff. And with that, I will be back recorded next Thursday, 2 p.m. Eastern time here on YouTube. Later, everybody.